Part One of Chapter Seven, On the Way from Kangwe to Lake Nkovi, of Travels in West Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Travels in West Africa, by Mary H. Kingsley. Part One of Chapter Seven, on the way from Kangwe to Lake Inkovi. In which the voyager goes for bush again, and wanders into a new lake and a new river. July twenty second, eighteen ninety five. Left Kangwe. The four Ajuba. Did not turn up early in the morning as had been arranged, but arrived about eight in pouring rain. So we decided to wait until two o'clock, which will give us time to reach their town of Arivuma before nightfall, and may perhaps give us a chance of arriving there dry. At two we start. We go down river on the Kangwe side of Lembarene Island. Make a pause in front of the Igalwa slave town, which is on the island and nearly opposite the fan town of Fula, on the mainland bank. Our motive being to get stores of yam and plantain, and magnificent specimens of both we get, and then, when our canoe is laden with them to an extent that would get us into trouble under the act if it ran here, off we go again. Every canoe we meet shouts us a greeting and asks where we are going, and we say Rembwe, and they say What? Rembwe, and we say Yes, Rembwe, and paddle on. I lay among the luggage for about an hour, not taking much interest in the Rembwe or anything else save my own headache, but this soon lifted, and I was able to take notice. Just before we reached the Ajumba's town called Arevuma, the sandbanks stretch across the river here nearly a wash, so all our cargo of yams has to be thrown overboard onto the sand, from which they can be collected by being waded out too. The canoe, thus lightened, is able to go on a little further. But we are soon hard and fast again, and the crew have to jump out and shove her off about once every five minutes, and then to look lively about jumping back into her again, as she shoots over the cliffs of the sandbanks. When we reach Arevuma, I find it is a very prettily situated town on the left-hand bank of the river, clean and well kept. And composed of houses built on the Igalwa and Impongwe plan, with walls of split bamboo, and a palm thatch roof. I own I did not much care for these Ajumbas on starting, but they are evidently going to be kind and pleasant companions. One of them is a gentlemanly-looking man, who wears a grey shirt. Another looks like a genial Irishman, who has accidentally got black, very black. He is distinguished by wearing a singlet. Another is a thin elderly man, notably silent, and the remaining one is a strapping big fellow, as black as a wolf's mouth, of gigantic muscular development, and wearing quantities of fittish charms hung about him. The two first mentioned are Christians, the other two pagans, and I will refer to them by their characteristic points, for their honourable names are awfully alike when you do hear them, and, as is usual with Africans, rarely used in conversation. Grey Shirt places his house at my disposal, and both he and his exceedingly pretty wife do their utmost to make me comfortable. The house lies at the west end of the town. It is one room inside, 
but has, I believe, a separate cooking shed. In the veranda, in front, is placed a table, an ivory bundle chair, and a gourd of water. And I am also treated to a calico tablecloth, and most thoughtfully screened off from the public gaze with more calico, so that I can have my tea in privacy. After this meal, to my surprise, Ndaka turns up. Certainly, he is one of the very ugliest men, black or white, I have ever seen, and I fancy one of the best. He is now on a holiday from Kangwe, seeing to the settlement of his dead brother's affairs. The dead brother was a great man in Arevuma, and a pagan, but Ndaka, the Christian Bible reader, seems to get on perfectly with the family, and is holding to-night a meeting outside his brother's house, and comes with a lantern to fetch me to attend it. Of course, I have to go, headache or no headache. Most of the town was there, mainly as spectators. Ndaka and my two Christian boatmen manage the service between them, and what with the hymns and the mosquitoes, the experience is slightly awful. We sit in a line in front of the house, which is brilliantly lit up, our own lantern on the ground before us, acting as a rival entertainment to the house-lamps inside for some of the best insect society in Africa, who— after the manner of the insect world, insist on regarding us as responsible for their own idiocy in getting singed, and sting us in revenge, while we slap hard, as we howl hymns, in the fearful Igalwa and Imbongwe way. Next to an English picnic, the most uncomfortable thing I know is an open-air service in this part of Africa. Service being over, Ndaka takes me over the house to show its splendors. The great brilliancy of its illumination arises from its being lit up by two hanging lamps burning paraffin oil. The most remarkable point about the house is the floor, which is made of split, plated bamboo. It gives under your feet, in an alarming way, being raised some three or four feet above the ground, and I am haunted by the fear that I shall go through it and give pain to myself and great trouble to others before I could be got out. It is a beautiful piece of workmanship, and Arevuma has every reason to be proud of it. Having admired these things, I go, dead tired and still headachy, down the road with my host, who carries the lantern, through an atmosphere that has forty-five per cent of solid matter in the shape of mosquitoes. Then, wishing him good night, I shut myself in, and illuminate humbly with a candle. The furniture of the house consists mainly of boxes, containing the wealth of grey shirt, in clothes, mirrors, etc., one corner of the room is taken up by great calabashes, full of some sort of liquor, and there is an ivory bundle chair, a hanging mirror, several rusty guns, and a considerable collection of china basins and jugs. Evidently, Grey Shirt is rich. The most interesting article to me, however, just now is the bed, hung over with a clean, substantial chintz, mosquito bar, and spread with clean calico, and adorned with patchwork-covered pillows. So I take off my boots and put on my slippers, for it never does in this country to leave off boots altogether at any time, and risk getting bitten by mosquitoes on the feet when you are on the march, because the rub of your boot on the bite always produces a sore, and a sore when it comes in the gorilla country, comes to stay. No sooner have I carefully swished all the mosquitoes from under the bar and turned in, than a cat scratches and meows at the door, 
turn out and let her in. She is evidently a pet, so I take her on to the bed with me. She is a very nice cat, sandy and fat, and if I held the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl, I should have no hesitation in saying she had in her the soul of Dame Juliana Berners, such a whole-souled devotion to sport does she display, dashing out through the flaps of the mosquito bar after rats, which, amid squeals from the rats and curses from her, she kills amongst the china collection. Then she comes to me, triumphant, expecting congratulations, and accompanied by mosquitoes, and purrs and knees upon my chest until she hears another rat. Tuesday, July 23rd Am aroused by violent knocking at the door in the early grey dawn, so violent that two large centipedes and a scorpion drop on to the bed. They have evidently been tucked away among the folds of the bar all night. Well, when ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise, particularly along here. I get up without delay, and find myself quite well. The cat has thrown a basin of water neatly over into my bag during her nocturnal hunts, and when my tea comes I am informed a man done die in the night, which explains the firing of guns I heard. I inquire what he has died of, and am told he just struck luck and then he die. His widows are having their faces painted white by sympathetic lady friends, and are attired in their oldest, dirtiest clothes, and, but very few of them, still they seem to be taking things in a resigned spirit. These Ajumba seem pleasant folk. They play with their pretty brown children in a taking way. Last night I noticed some men and women playing a game new to me, which consisted in throwing a hoop at each other. The point was to get the hoop to fall over your adversary's head. It is a cheerful game. Quantities of the common house fly about, and during the early part of the morning it rains in a gentle kind of way. But soon after we are afloat in our canoe it turns into a soft white mist. We paddle still westwards down the broad quiet waters of the Orembo Vongo. I notice great quantities of birds about here, great hornbills, vividly colored kingfishers, and for the first time the great vulture I have often heard of, and the skin of which I will take home before I mention even its proximate spread of wing. There are also noble white cranes, and flocks of small black and white birds, new to me, with heavy razor-shaped bills reminding one of the Devonian puffin. The hornbill is perhaps the most striking in appearance. It is the size of a small, or say a good-sized, hen turkey. Gray shirt says the flocks, which are of eight or ten, always have the same quantity of cocks and hens, and that they live together, white man fashion, i.e., each couple keeping together. They certainly do a great deal of courting, the cock filling out his waddles on his neck like a turkey, and spreading out his tail with great pomp and ceremony, but very awkwardly. To see hornbills on a bare sand-bank is a solemn sight, but when they are dodging about in the hippo-grass they sink ceremony and roll and waddle, looking, my man said, for snakes and the little sandfish which are close in under the bank, and their killing way of dropping their jaws, I should say, opening their bills when they are alarmed, is comic. I think this has something to do with their hearing, for I often saw two or three of them in a line, on a long branch, standing, stretched up to their full height, their great eyes opened wide, and all with their great beaks open, evidently listening for something. Their cry is most peculiar, and can only be mistaken for a native horn, and although there seems little variety in it to my ear, 
there must be more to theirs, for they will carry on long confabulations with each other across a river, and, I believe, sit up half the night and talk scandal. There were plenty of plantain eaters here, but although their screech was as appalling as I have heard in Angola, they were not regarded by the Ajumba, at any rate, as being birds of evil omen, as they are in Angola. Still, by no means, all the birds here only screech and squark. Several of them have very lovely notes. There is one who always gives a series of infinitely beautiful, soft, rich-toned whistles just before the light of the dawn shows in the sky, and one at least who has a prolonged and very lovely song. This bird, I was told in Gaboon, is called Telephonus erythropterus. I expect an ornithologist would enjoy himself here, but I cannot, and will not, collect birds. I hate to have them killed anyhow, and particularly in the barbarous way in which these natives kill them. The broad stretch of water looks like a long lake. In all directions sandbanks are showing their broad yellow backs, and there will be more showing soon, for it is not yet the height of the dry. We are perpetually grounding on those which by next month will be above water. These canoes are built, I believe, more with a view to taking sandbanks comfortably than anything else, but they are by no means yet sufficiently specialized for getting off them. Their flat bottoms enable them to glide on to the banks and sit there, without either upsetting or cutting into the sand, as a canoe with a keel would. But the trouble comes in when you are getting off the steep edge of the bank, and the usual form it takes is upsetting. So far my Ajumba friends have only tried to meet this difficulty by tying the cargo in. I try to get up the geography of this region conscientiously. Fortunately I find Grey Shirt, Singlet, and Pagan can speak trade English. None of them, however, seem to recognize a single blessed name on the chart, which is saying nothing against the chart and its makers, who probably got their names up from Impongues and Igalwas instead of Ajumba, as I am trying to. Geographical research in this region is fraught with difficulty. I find, owing to different tribes calling one and the same place by different names, and I am sure the Royal Geographical Society ought to insert among their hints that every traveller in this region should carefully learn every separate native word, or set of words signifying, I don't know. Four villages and two rivers I have come across out here solemnly set down with various forms of this statement for their native name. Really, I think the old Portuguese way of naming places after saints, etc., was wiser in the long run, and it was certainly pleasanter to the ear. My Ajumba, however, know about my Ngambi and the Venu all right, and Eliviazi Azingo, so I must try and get cross-bearings from these. We have, in addition to our crew, this morning, a man who wants to go and get work at John Holt's sub-factory away on the Rembwe. He has been waiting a long while at Arevuma, unable to get across. I am told, because the road is now stopped between Aizingo and the Rembwe, by those fearful fans. "'How are we going to get through that way?' says I, with natural feminine alarm. We are not, sir, says Grey Shirt. This is what Lady MacDonald would term a chatty little incident, and my hair begins to rise, as I remember what I have been told about those fans, and the indications I have already seen of its being true when on the upper Ogowe. Now here we are going to try to get through the heart of their country, far from a French station and without the French flag. Why did I not obey Mr. Hudson's orders not to go wandering about in a reckless way? Anyhow, I am in for it, and fortune favors the brave. The only question is, do I individually come under this class? I go into details. It seems Pagan thinks he can depend on the friendship of two fans he once met and did business with, and who now live on an island in Lake Nkovi, 
Inkovi is not down on my map, and I have never heard of it before. Anyhow, thither we are bound now. Each man has brought with him his best gun loaded to the muzzle, and tied on to the baggage against which I am leaning, the muzzle sticking out each side of my head, the flint locks covered with cases, or sheaths, made of the black-haired skins of gorillas, leopard skin, and a beautiful bright bay skin, which I do not know, which they say is bush cow, but they call half a dozen things bush cow. These guns are not the gas pipes I have seen up north, but decent rifles which have had the rifling filed out and the locks replaced by flint locks and converted into muzzle loaders, and many of them have beautiful barrels. I find the Ajumba name for the beautiful shrub that has long bunches of red, yellow, and cream-colored young leaves at the end of its branches is Obaa. I also learn that in their language ebony and a monkey have one name. The forest on either bank is very lovely. Some enormously high columns of green are formed by a sort of climbing plant having taken possession of lightning-struck trees, and in one place it really looks exactly as if someone had spread a great green coverlet over the forest so as to keep it dry. No high land showing in any direction. Pagan tells me the extinguisher-shaped juju, filled with medicine and made of iron, is against drowning. The red juju is for keep foot in path. Beautiful effect of a gleam of sunshine lighting up a red sandbank till it glows like the imbelundin gold. Indeed, the effects are turneresque to-day owing to the mist, and the sun playing in and out among it. The sandbanks now have their cliffs to the north-northwest and northwest. At nine-thirty, the broad river in front of us is apparently closed by sandbanks which run out from the banks thus. Yellow, south bank bright red, north bank yellow. Current running strong along south bank. This bank bears testimony of this also being the case in the wet season, for a fringe of torn-down trees hangs from it into the river. Pass Seque, a town on North Bank interchanging the usual observations regarding our destination. The river seems absolutely barred with sand again, but as we paddle down it, the obstructions resolve themselves into spits of sand from the North Bank and the largest island in midstream, which also has a long tail, or train, of sandbank down river. Here we meet a picturesque series of canoes, fruit and trade laden, being poled upstream, one man with his pole over one side, the other with his pole over the other, making a St. Andrew's cross as you meet them end on. Most luxurious, charming, and pleasant trip this! The men are standing up, swinging in rhythmic motion, their long, rich red wood paddles in perfect time to their elaborate, melancholy, minor key boat song. Nearly lost, with all hands. Sandbank palaver. Only when we were going over the end of it, the canoe slipped sideways over its edge. River deep, bottom sand and mud. This information may be interesting to the geologist, but I hope I shall not be converted by circumstances into a human-sounding apparatus again to-day. Next time she strikes, I shall get out and shove behind. We are now skirting the real north bank, and not the bank of an island or islands as we have been for some time heretofore. Lovely stream falls into this river over cascades. The water is now rough in a small way, and the width of the river great but it soon is crowded again with wooded islands. There are patches and wreaths of a lovely vermilion flowering bush rope decorating the forest, and now and again clumps of a plant that shows a yellow and crimson spike of bloom, very strikingly beautiful. We pass a long tunnel in the bush, quite dark as you look down it, evidently the path to some native town. The south bank is covered where the falling waters have exposed it with hippo-grass. Terrible lot of mangrove flies about, 
although we are more than one hundred miles above the mangrove belt. River broad again, tending west-southwest, with a broad flattened island with attributive sandbanks in the middle. The fairways along the south bank of the river. Gray Shirt tells me this river is called the Orembovongo, or small river, so as to distinguish it from the main stream of the Ogowe, which goes down past the south side of Lembarene Island, as well I know after that canoe affair of mine. Aizingo now bears due north, and native mahogany is called Okuma. Pass a village called Welli, on north bank. It looks like some gypsy caravan stuck on poles. I expect that village has known what it means to be swamped by the rising river. It looks as if it had, very hastily, in the middle of some night, taken to stilts, which I am sure, from their present rickety condition, will not last through the next wet season, and then some unfortunate spirit will get the blame of the collapse. I also learn that it is the natal spot of my friend Cabinda, the carpenter at Andande. Now, if some of these good people I know would only go and distinguish themselves, I might write a sort of county family history of these parts. But they don't, and I fancy won't. For example, the entrance, or should I say the exit, of a broadish little river is just away on the south bank. If you go up this river, it runs southeast. You get to a good-sized lake. In this lake there is an island called Andole. Then out of the other side of the lake there is another river, which falls into the Ogowe main stream. But that is not the point of the story. Which is that on that island of Adole? Ngota, the interpreter, first saw the light. Why he ever did, there or anywhere, heaven only knows. I know I shall never want to write his biography. On the western bank end of that river going to Adole, there is an Igalwa town, notable for a large quantity of fine white ducks and a clump of Indian bamboo. My informants say no white men ever live for this place. So I suppose the ducks and bamboo have been imported by some black trader whose natal spot this is. The name of this village is Wanderegwoma. Stuck on sandbank, I flew out and shoved behind, leaving Ngota to do the balancing performances in the stern. This Orembo Vongo divides up just below here, I am told, when we have re-embarked into three streams. One goes into the Menogowe, opposite Aishuka in Inkama country. Inkama country commences at Aishuka and goes to the sea, one into the Ngumbi and one into the Ngonghi, all in the Orungu country. Aizingo now lies northeast, according to Grayshirt's arm. On our river there is here another broad low island, with its gold-colored banks shining out, seemingly barring the entire channel, but there is really a canoe channel along by both banks. We turn at this point into a river on the north bank that runs north and south. The current is running very swift to the north. We run down into it, and then, it being more than time enough for chop, we push the canoe onto a sandbank in our new river, which, I am told, is the Karkola. I, after having had my tea, wander off and find behind our high sandbank, which, like all the other sandbanks above water now, is getting grown over with hippo grass, a fine light green grass, the beloved food of both hippo and manatee, a forest, and entering this I notice a succession of strange mounds or heaps, made up of branches, twigs, and leaves, and dead flowers. Many of these heaps are recent, while others have fallen into decay. Investigation shows they are burial places. Among the debris of an old one there are human bones, and out from one of the new ones comes a stench and a hurrying, exceedingly busy line of ants, demonstrating what is going on. I own I thought these mounds were some kind of birds or animal's nest. They look entirely unhuman in this desolate ridge of forest. Leaving these, I go down to the water edge of the sand and find in it a quantity of pools of varying breadth and expanse, but each surrounded by a rim of dark red-brown deposit, which you can lift off the sand in a skin. 
On the top of the water is a film of exquisite iridescent colors like those on a soap bubble, only darker and brighter. In the river alongside the sand there are thousands of those beautiful little fish with a black line each side of their tails. They are perfectly tame, and I feed them with crumbs in my hand. After making every effort to terrify the unknown object containing the food, gallant bulls, quite two inches long, sidling up and snapping at my fingers, they come and feed right in the palm, so that I could have caught them by the handful had I wished. There are also a lot of those weird, semi-transparent, yellow-spotted little sandfish, with cup-shaped pectoral fins, which I see they use to enable them to make their astoundingly long leaps. These fish are of a more nervous and distrustful disposition, and hover around my hand but will not come into it. Indeed, I do not believe the other cheeky little fellows would allow them to. The men, having had their rest and their pipes, shout for me, and off we go again. The carcola soon widens to about a hundred feet. It is evidently very deep here. The right bank, the east, is forested, the left low and shrubbed, one patch looking as if it were being cleared for a plantation, but no village showing. A big rock shows up on the right bank, which is a change from the clay and sand, and soon the whole character of the landscape changes. We come to a sharp turn in the river, from north and south to east and west, the current very swift. The river channel dodges round against a big bank of sword grass, and then widens out to the breadth of the Thames at Putney. I am told that a river runs out of it here to the west, to Orungu country, and so I imagine this Karkola falls ultimately into the Nazareth. We skirt the eastern banks, which are covered with low grass, with a scanty lot of trees along the top. Highland shows in the distance to the south-southwest and south-west, and then we suddenly turn up into a broad river or strait, shaping our course north-north-east. On the opposite bank, on a high dwarf cliff, is a fan town. All fan now, says Singlet, in anything but a gratified tone of voice. End of Part 1 Chapter 7 on the way from Kangwe to Lake Inkovi. Read by Kehinde of Pahatrek.com.